Uh, good afternoon and welcome back to Grand Rounds today. Um, please remember to uh, sign the attendance record and also please remember to fill out and uh, return the program evaluations and uh, please also if you have any ideas in regards to future topics or future speakers, please let us know. Uh, today uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Akshak Sarda. Dr. Sarda holds multiple certifications. He's board certified in uh, internal medicine, cardiology, echocardiography, nuclear cardiology, vascular medicine, uh, advanced heart failure, and hypertension. Uh, and hypertension. Hyper, yeah, I was going to say, and most importantly, he is certified by the American Society of Hypertension in, uh, as a hypertension uh, specialist. Uh, he kindly has accepted our uh, invitation today to uh, give us a review of hypertension, and uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarda. Thank you very much. Is it working yet? Working? Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, I was instructed by the boss, that will be my wife, not to have any jokes. Um, <laughs> she wants me to be politically correct. Um, so no jokes today. Um, I. Uh, when, when we started talking about it, Steve told me, you have 45 minutes and you have to teach hypertension. I will teach in 30 minutes, and 15 minutes would be my stand-up comedy routine. I have uh, no financial disclosure for this uh, uh, presentation. Those of you who know me, uh, you know my wife gives me $50 a month uh, as an allowance, but this is Christmas uh, month. I have been given $100 extra, so I don't care what Steve pays me today. Um, we will talk about uh, 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 what, what actually we want to achieve today. Um, and there are a lot of questions, and there are a lot of uh, words on the slides. You please read it. It's in English, um, uh, not in Iowan. And we will talk about the basic things, what you need to know to treat hypertension. And if we do not cover those topics, then you can send those patients to so-called specialist here, and we can, we can deal with these things. Um, the biggest thing which I have seen is, uh, and our MAs and nurses who room the patients need to know, is how to check the blood pressure. And blood pressure checking uh, is very important. And uh, uh, this guy Kuratkov gave these sounds first, fifth. He, his name is written here. And what it means is when, when you have pressure cuff up, the first time you hear a sound is the first sound. And then there will be multiple sounds. And before muffling, muffling kind of a sound, before it goes away, the muffles is the fifth sound. So first sound is your systolic blood pressure. The muffled sound is your diastolic blood pressure. And most of our blood pressures are checked by our automated machines, and they are pretty good if they are calibrated well. But if you have any concerns, patient move the arm, something else happened, and if it doesn't make sense, check it manually. And ICU nurses know that we ask them all the time, can you check it manually? Cath lab nurses know, can you check it man manually when it doesn't make sense? So you need to know how to check blood pressure manually. Do not rely totally on the automated machines, although they are very good. For board purposes, they would ask you these questions. What's the pulse pressure? What's the mean arterial pressure? What's mid blood pressure? All those things. So MAP is the mean arterial blood pressure, which uh, usually we follow. The surgeons here in the audience also follow their MAPs and all those things. And they give orders on a MAP. And MAP is diastolic blood pressure plus one third of the systolic blood pressure. And if your math is my math, it is very hard to calculate. So uh, be very sure that you calculate it right. It's different than mid blood pressure. Just remember that because we want, we'll give an order of keep the map above 60 or keep the map above 65. That is what it means. For hypertension, most of us will get hypertension. If you live long enough, most of us will get hypertension. I'll come to that slide. But what are the risk factors? Um, so cigarette smoking, one of the biggest one, including secondhand smoking. Uh, Dr. Carino is walking down with his uh, carbohydrate load. Uh, diabetes mellitus is one of the biggest uh, uh, risk factor, dyslipidemia. Obesity, uh, overweight, in fact, is also there. Uh, physical inactivity, which we most of us uh, are suffering from physical inactivity disease. 
and unhealthy diet. Uh, for hypertension, I'm pretty sure they gave you a healthy diet today. Uh, uh, do we agree or not? Um, the other factors are risk, uh, CKD, uh, uh, family history, increased age. So if we lo live long enough, we will have high blood pressure. Somewhere low social economic status come in every aspect of it. And my daughter was writing a paper yesterday uh, for her uh, one of the courses about accessibility of healthcare. And uh, somewhere the hypertension came and this low socioeconomic status came and she was doing her research. And she asked me a question. I said, from now onwards, don't call me. You can put low socioeconomic status in every of these disease risks. And you have, we have to be very careful about this. What are, this is a multifactorial thing. And you always take this into consideration. Uh, males, my friends, you are not very uh, in good luck here. Uh, sleep apnea and uh, psychosocial stress. Now, stress, uh, before I even go, I just saw a patient 15 minutes ago. Her blood pressure was 92 or 50. She was on four medications. I saw that patient a week or 10 days ago in the hospital on the fourth floor. We discharged her. At that time, her blood pressure was 170, 180, systolic blood pressure. And we gave her a lot of medications. So we see this labile hypertension, see this stress-induced hypertension all the time, one or two patients a day. And this is an extremely important thing. When you take a patient phone call, when you see a patient, what their social status is at that, th what their psychological status is at that time. And that drives the blood pressure quite a bit. It's a, it's a thing which is usually not dealt with in books, in the boards, in the other things, but it is very, very common, very, very common in the day and age we are living. And, and between Thanksgiving and Christmas, when people are stressed out, where people would sit on the Thanksgiving table to what we will give for the gifts, uh, the blood pressure and stress goes quite high. So be, be very careful about that. Um, if you are not confused enough, we will confuse you. Uh, and every year, these so-called specialists, they sit on a table, they fly first class, they stay in a nice hotel, and then they give us guidelines and nothing but confusing. Every single time I, uh, I turn around, there is a new guideline, a new, so we are going to simplify it today. Current, as of 10 minutes ago, uh, normal blood pressure was 120 over 80. Uh, elevated 120 to 129, so everybody's elevated. Stage one, we didn't have enough patients, so we made stage one, and it's 130 to 139, and stage two, which now onwards is 140, and then forget about rest of the classification. So stage one, 130 to 139, and stage two, 140 and above. Why do we stage these things? Because our management, treatment management is based on these things. And busy slide, but you can see how we manipulate the data and what is important is that if you see, if you see this category that is below 130 over 80 and below 140 over 90, you can see how many patients we have gained. But also to be noted that if you are 75 and above, most of us will have some sort of blood pressure issues. So it's important that we control the blood pressure. And the, and the reason they came up with the, these uh, uh, guidelines from here to here is the incidence and the prevalence of disease and the complications increase. Now, way back when, uh, maybe 10, 12, 15, 12, 13 years ago, I started teaching hypertension, or teaching means giving lectures. And there, I had some different kind of slides. And one slide was from an article from Lancet where uh, the lower the blood pressure, the better it was. But nowadays, we know that there is a J curve. And after a certain extent, it's not better. So blood pressure may be 100, and the event rate starts going up. Also, when you look at these numbers, be very careful and look at your patients. If there's a patient is at a fall risk, don't try to reduce blood pressure that much. And that's where family practice physicians, they tend to keep the blood pressures up. And the one reason that the guidelines a few years ago that one, up to 150 is fine is because the fall risk was high. And all, we all know if a patient falls, the prognosis is poor. So be very careful, and these are the guidelines by the experts. But if your patient is not doing well, 
And if you are trying to reduce the blood pressure with multiple medications, side effects are much, uh, and you are having problems, then do not stick too hard to these things. Uh, so let's look at the patient first. But there is a reason behind all these things, and these are the numbers. You all will be tested. Um, so again, garbage in, garbage out. And uh, uh, if we do not have the correct measurement of the blood pressure, we are not going to treat our patients very well. So you have to prepare the patient. Uh, use proper b blood pressure measurement techniques. And uh, uh, document accurate blood pressure. Uh, have some average readings. And provide the blood pressure reading to the patients. We, we, I, we, see cons we have a consultative practice. Uh, primary care physician see the patient, some other sees the patient. Last time they checked my blood pressure, it was normal. What was the number? They have no clue. So, and somebody says that your blood pressure is okay, becomes normal. So you are doing okay, becomes normal. So provide them with the readings. Uh, usually now the sign out sheets would have some sort of an information and if they don't have our IT guys can start developing those guidelines where they can provide at least the last blood pressure measurement when they left the office. Use the correct cuff size. Uh, people who do the blood pressures, please look into these things. And uh, people who arrange for these cuffs, please have these cuffs in the, in the uh, examination areas, in the ERs, in the hospital, in the rooms, and all those things, or somewhere which is accessible. And you would realize that we are looking for good functioning cuffs all the time. And we do not find these cuffs. So all the managers, please look into it and see uh, that you can provide us uh, uh, with these kind of equipment, which are very essential. Uh, now we'll talk about out of uh, office and self-monitoring of blood pressure. This is my favorite thing. I always tell the patients to check blood pressures uh, at home, uh, and this is very important. We can we can look into uh, how our medications are working. Is this a real diagnosis? And one, uh, entrepreneurs over here can think about telemedicine. This is going to, telehealth is going to come big time. Uh, or at least it appears that it's going to be big time. And if there are telehealth stocks available, Dr. Shapiro can guide me on that, and we can invest on that. Because I think it's going to come big time. So uh, this would be helpful. Now. All blood pressures are not equal. So clinic blood pressure may not be the same as nighttime blood pressure, maybe not be the same as home blood pressure monitoring and all those things. And if you look at it, it, as the clinic blood pressure goes up, you can see the corresponding home blood pressures and night blood pressures are still not that high. So not all decisions made should be made on in clinic uh, blood pressures alone, because there are multiple factors where clinic blood pressure can be up or low. And, uh, and then we don't have better patient outcomes. So either patient's blood pressures are high, or they are falling down, or they are weak, tired, dizzy. So one concept which is not very uh, read and which, which not very understood about is the mask blood pressure. White coat hypertension, even our patients know. They say, oh, doctor, I have white coat. And you, that's right. But the mask hypertension is when the blood pressure is OK in the office, but not OK at home. And that is also important to understand. So home blood pressure monitoring becomes your key to finding those things. So if your, home blood, if your office blood pressures are not up to the goal, and, uh, and your home blood pressure would give you the guidelines whether uh, it's a white coat hypertension or not, and then you can treat it. Or if your office blood pressures are at goal, but if your outcomes are not good, then you look for masked hypertension. Reason for masked hypertension is same as you flossing to go uh, to your dentist. You know, before your dentist visit, you floss for a week, and everything is good. But it's not, you know. So the same thing. They take our medications. They take those things. They don't eat salt. They do everything well, OK, to prepare for the visit with the doctor. Um, so what do you do? These many words, but check the blood pressure and go with the goals. You want to read it? I'll move it. So blood pressure patterns based on office and out of office measurements, if you look into it, then they, we give, uh, give certain names. And sometimes in our notes, you will mention, we will mention that there is a masked hypertension or there is a white coat hypertension. And this is very, very easy for everybody to understand uh, that uh, 
uh, if you have sustained hypertension, you'll have hypertension at home at her, and at the office, and if it is masked, you will have normal hypertension, normal blood pressure in the office and hypertension at home, and vice versa for white coat hypertension. Very easy to understand, uh, 101. So, and how do you detect? You just go with the numbers, uh, look at the daytime uh, or ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. Uh, if it's white coat hypertension, you do lifestyle modification and you do detection uh, programs uh, like uh, annual blood pressure readings or when you're reading at home, uh, reading at the office or fairs and all those things. And if there's an hypertension and the, if it is less than 130 over 80, uh, then you start doing your lifestyle modification. And we'll come to this a little bit more. So once you have an office goal blood pressure, uh, then you are pretty much good uh, just to make sure there is no masked hypertension and you are good. And if your office goal blood pressure is not there, uh, then you again screen for white coat hypertension. Uh, and if it is at goal or not, we'll come to that again later. So the concept which I wanted to bring today uh, to the audience was uh, masked hypertension, which is not very well understood, uh, which is very common, more than what we know. And sometimes we see that the patients are not doing well. They are coming to the ER with heart failure and other episodes. But in the office, the blood pressures have been controlled. Uh, what is the reason? So look for it. This would be one teaching point for today. Uh, so causes of hypertension. Um, one is, as we talked about, if you live long enough, you will have hypertension. And 80, 90% of us have this, uh, this issue and we call this as an essential hypertension. Essential hypertension essentially means that we don't know what is happening. And then there will be uh, secondary forms of hypertension. Uh, when do you look for it? The plain simple, you have tried hard and it is not working for you. Uh, usually it is three medications. Uh, so if an adult with sustained hypertension screens positive for any secondary hypertension, then we would like uh, the patient to be referred to that particular specialty which is causing that. And usually it ends up uh, being either an endocrinologist, a cardiologist, a vascular surgeon, et cetera, or a sleep medicine uh, person, et cetera. So, so what do you do? How, when you do screening for secondary hypertension is you have either a new onset or uncontrolled blood pressure. Uh, and it can be drug res resistant or induced hypertension. It can be an abrupt onset of hypertension. And we had a case here where uh, this young man who had abrupt onset hypertension, we did not, uh, it was not well controlled. Um, fortunately, he was diagnosed with pheochromocytoma. Uh, one of the surgeons here operated on him. One of the endocrinologists uh, diagnosed him and the uh, outcome was very good. Uh, if you have an onset of hypertension in early age, look for secondary hypertension. Uh, if you have a patient who is very well controlled and all of a sudden he is unable to control, look for secondary hypertension. If you see target organ damage which is disproportionate to his blood pressure, then there is some sort of a secondary hypertension. Um, many a people you will see that uh, the blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure only starts rising up after 65 years of age. So look for a secondary hypertension. And if you see unprovoked hypokalemia with hypertension or excessive hypokalemia with hypertension, there is some problem going on. And we have caught a case or two in 10 years here. So these are the things which should think of, we should think about what is wrong, we should be looking for a secondary cause. And if you are unable to get a handle of it, we are there to help you out. So what are the common causes? So renal parenchymal disease is still one of the commonest reason for secondary hypertension. Uh, as our population is aging, and also uh, atherosclerotic risk factors are not being very well controlled, we see renovascular hypertension. And these are the patients where the blood pressure was very well controlled. They show up with uh, pulmonary edema, blood pressures of 180, 190, and you listen to their uh, uh, abdomen. And uh, sometimes if the patient is uh, OK from body habitus, you can hear a brewery. Otherwise, send them for uh, a vascular exam, and you find a renal artery stenosis. Uh, primary aldo, we just talked about a little bit. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea is very, very common, very, very common. 
Uh, although the recent data says that it does not cause that much of hypertension, but it's still very common in some patients, you will see that it works with some sort of a salt loading and other issues, and it helps, and drug or alcohol induced. Um, again, uh, if uh, old saying, if a patient says that uh, I drink one, then you may make two, four, whatever it is, and my I think everybody all uh, had that kind of situation, but I was no, new to America many years ago, nearly 20 years ago, and uh, I was in an internal medicine clinic uh, in Detroit, Michigan. The guy says, I drink two beers. And uh, to my attending, it did not make sense. I had no idea what ounces are, and he was drinking 40 ounces, two beers. So, uh, and that's how we figured out those. So make sure that the alcohol intake history is good. Uncommon causes which we check everybody, and one of them is pheochromocytoma. Very, very uncommon, but uh, we check it because it's a blood, blood test or sometimes a urine test, and um, what we see once a year, we have two people here who deal with it, and once a year or so, or twice a year or so. But once they are there, uh, you treat them very well, and they are cured. So this hypertension would be cured. Uh, if you diagnose a pheochromocytoma and involve your endocrinologist, it's a very difficult condition, very complicated situation, and if you don't have experience and if you start giving them medications which you are not supposed to give, you can cause major problems. So it's, uh, involve your endocrinologist. Cushing syndrome, uh, we don't see that much uh, here, uh, but we have uh, Cushingoid people with the high amount of prednisone and all those things, and if you give prednisone, you will see that the blood pressure going up, and when you stop prednisone, usually it goes up. Hypo and hyperthyroidism, both, so check a TSH on everybody. Uh, we will see aortic coarctation, and uh, in our lab here, we diagnosed a patient at 68 years of age. Uh, with coarctation, which was undiagnosed, and blood pressure was uncontrolled. In uh, medically cath lab, we diagnosed the case at 68. So be very careful, listen to the patients well, look at the echo report well. Uh, primary hyperparathyroidism, uh, we have a lot of cases of that, and I think last week they were looking for some parathyroidectomy. Uh, so very common, uh, involve people, uh, ch uh, check an intact PTH and uh, make sure that you are not dealing with the obviously you are looking for calcium and other things. Congenital adrenal hyperplasia, I don't know if uh, uh, some uh, pediatric uh, colleagues are here who can help me out on that, uh, and uh, primary aldo, and you can see some cases of acromegaly. So here you, there is a theme that these are endocrine disorders or congenital disorders, and uh, be careful, and sometimes it doesn't hurt to contact our endocrine guys here uh, when we are unable to diagnose these things. And some tests can be very hard to order, what to order, not to order kind of things, and they can help us out. So uh, if uh, all levels, even nursing students, you will be asked this question, internal medicine, family practice, cardiology, uh, nephrology. These are usually the board questions which come in one or the other way. So recommendations for primary aldo. Um, you, uh, you, it's recommended the, if you have resistant hypertension, hypokalemia, which can be spontaneous, substantial, even, uh, even if diuretic induced, and uh, incidentally covered, uh, discovered adrenal mass, uh, early uh, onset hypertension, and stroke at young age. Uh, having said that, you can have normal potassium and still have uh, um, primary aldosteronism, so be very careful about that. And use of aldorenin uh, uh, activity ratio, uh, this is a good test uh, uh, for adults to screen. And if you have a positive screen, um, again, referral to a hypertension specialist or endocrinologist. And I would recommend you to uh, send the patient to endocrine, uh, endocrinology, but because we end up sending them. Even if they come to us, we call them and uh, do that. Uh, we will see these cases. We will see these cases, and uh, um, uh, sometimes this hypokalemia we see with uh, arrhythmias and all those things, and high blood pressure, and what's going on, and that's where the diagnosis is. Uh, renal artery stenosis way more common uh, than we think, but it may not be causing hypertension. So there are certain guidelines when we do revascularization or not, uh, but if it is uncontrolled, uh, hypertension with a high degree of renal artery stenosis, 
uh, we have seen patients who improve remarkably well after revascularization. So if medical management has failed, refractory hypertension, worsening renal function, uh, renal function or intractable high heart failure, um, and people with fibromuscular dysplasia, FMDs, and young, young people usually we see that, and you do the revascularization, and they do remarkably well. Uh, there was a time 10, 15, 15, 20 years ago when everybody who was getting an angiogram, we used to use a lot of femoral approach and renal arteries right there, and we will do a drive-by angiogram and we fix it. Uh, uh, because you'll find a blockage, you'll fix it. Those people did not do well. So we do not revascularize everybody who has renal artery stenosis. Um, recommendations for obstructive sleep apnea. Um, use it. Do it. It's very hard. Uh, uh, many people who we do not realize may have obstructive apnea, may have obstructive, and people with normal weight can also have a good history Airport sleepiness score, which is not very well teased out that it really helps, but a good history and a good screening and sometimes a good test. And nowadays we have home test and they are not that expensive, can be done. So no matter what we do, pharmacological uh, interventions, we can quickly go over. That's not much of it. It's the non-pharmacological interventions. And uh, that is the keystone of uh, blood pressure management. And I used to have those slides where I would say that these uh, things uh, decrease this much of blood pressure, exercise will decrease your blood pressure by five, and weight will decrease by 10, and all those things. But remember one thing, if you can decrease weight by 10 kilos, the chances are eight to 10 millimeters of blood pressure reduction. And if you reduce any other with two, like sodium reduction, or potassium supplementation and all those things, five to 10, five to 10 points. And when we go through the pharmacological management, you will realize the first drug will decrease blood pressure by 15 to 20, second drug by 10. So this is one medication right sitting there. And if you do very good non-pharmacological interventions, you have two medications sitting right there. But guess what? We do not do very well on non-pharmacological interventions, whether it is coronary artery disease, whether it's heart failure, whether it's hypertension, whether it's depression, uh, whether it's back pain, whether it's knee pain. Those are the key things in life where it will make real, 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 real uh, intervention and uh, uh, get good results out of it. So salt-restricted diet. Now, there will be some controversies, but most of the people, uh, they eat way more salt than what we think they should be eating. Um, you will, whatever I say, you will hear a controversy, and there will be a paper published which goes against it, but it doesn't make much of a sense. We know from our experience, if you decrease the salt, the blood pressure decreases because we are eating too much, uh, including today. Um, so, uh, um, so increase phys physical activity by a structured exercise program. That helps. Um, I have a very structured uh, exercise program. Dr. Shapiro and I are uh, exercise buddies. I go once a month. Uh, so, and my wife pays for it. But, uh, uh, but that's how it is. So I go regularly once a month. Um, but we have to have a structured program. And uh, uh, that really helps. Uh, alcohol. I don't drink alcohol, so I don't know what I'm missing, but people say you're missing quite a bit. Um, so two drinks for males and one drink for females. That is the, uh, that is the standard drink, whatever they call one beer, uh, ounces, ounces, one ounce of alcohol, two ounces, I don't know, There's some, this much alcohol. Uh, and uh, uh, anything more than that is too much. And my suggestion is if you are with a heart failure, if you have atrial fibrillation, if you have hypertension, try to avoid alcohol because it really helps. So weight loss, oh, I have this slide. I don't like it because you can see that the, these are the numbers. Oh, we'll just uh, reduce uh, blood pressure by five. I don't care, then I can be body weight this much. But no, these all add up to two medications. Um, 
aerobic exercise, they don't want us too much. They want only 90 minutes, uh, 90 to 150 minutes a week. That's it, not too much. So if you do three to four, uh, four days of exercise, you, you achieve uh, most of the things which you want to. So how do you, how much where are we? Patient evaluation, um, don't do too many tests. So you do a fasting blood glucose, you have a complete blood count, lipid profile, serum creatinine, um, BMP, TSH, urine analysis, and, and electrocardiogram. Nobody, not everybody needs every test, although we order everybody, but not everybody needs it. Echocardiogram, um, unless until you have something on the EKG or something, but if they end up in my practice, everybody gets an echocardiogram, you know, because I have the machine. Uh, uric acid, you should, I usually check if, uh, if things are not going well, and uh, uh, urine albumin creatinine ratio, at least in people with CKD and diabetes, you will see that these makes a decision how we treat them. So treatment of high blood pressure. So first we establish uh, there's too much of mumbo jumbo here and we have very little time. So one, you make sure what their cardiovascular risk is and there are online calculators and 10% more, 10% below 10% and above 10% will make some of your decision making. Uh, and as we talked about uh, normal tension and then uh, pre-hypertension or whatever in stage one and stage two, uh, we, we will try to get to our targets there. Uh, so if the risk is greater than 10%, uh, then we treat them aggressively. If it is less, then we should still treat them, but not that aggressively. Again, aggressively means we are giving them a lot of medications. Everybody gets non-pharmacological interventions. So this is a fancy way of uh, explaining things. Again, line diagram for people like me that helps. And if you can read it, 120 over 80, promote optimal lifestyle. Everybody gets this and reassess in one year. That means everybody who walks to your door gets an annual visit, and I don't think we are, patients will be able to afford it, and we will be able to afford it, but that is what it is. If your blood pressure is 120 to 129, and you see I don't talk too much about diastolic blood pressure, because most of the time when your systolic blood pressure are within control, your diastolic blood pressures are controlled, but in young people, keep an eye on your diastolic blood pressure. If it is greater than 80, uh, you have to have non-pharmacological therapy to start with, but you have to reassess them very fast because these are the people you would be seeing that they would become hypertensive. And if it is uh, stage one hypertension where it's 80 to 89, and again, risk greater than 10% or more than, uh, if no, non-pharmacological therapy, if yes, this is where this is, and you see the number 130 to 139, we are starting them are recommending them to start on blood pressure medication. And good luck with that, because patients are not very happy to be uh, said that you, are hyper you have hypertension, the insurance and other premiums go up and other things, and blood pressure medications would have side effects. And if you have a stage two hypertension, which nowadays, which used to be 160, is to 140 over 90, you have right away BP lo uh, lowering medications. Uh, and it you should be starting those things. Not much of a difference. If you see from here to here, not much of a difference. So reassessment, if you are starting a patient on blood pressure medication, this is important, that you have to reassess in one month. And you will reassess in one month till the goals are not made. If the goals are met, then you will see it in three to six months. And with the busy practices we have and the access issues we have, it becomes a hard thing to do, but uh, it improves the outcomes tremendously. So these are at least the guidelines which we uh, follow. So we talked about this thing right now. And now we'll talk about management. And I put this slide initially because uh, this is one thing which we have to understand. Lot of young women are being treated for hypertension or are diagnosed with hypertension. With the current guidelines, if you would have gone back, you would have seen there will be 40% or chances, 30 to 40% chances that we will have either in pre-hypertension or hypertension stage or stage one, stage two, or at least stage one. 
And if you are of a childbearing age, oh, oh, sorry, this is a different, uh, different side. If you are a childbearing stage, don't use ACE inhibitors or ARBs. Very, very clear. We'll come back to again. And the second thing is, this is a little older slide, but we had some medications which had ACE inhibitors, ARB, or renin inhibitors combo. And that has been taken off market, but I see one patient every month or two months when we have a patient who is on ACE inhibitor and ARB. Renin inhibitors are pretty much out of the market, but ACE inhibitor and ARB combination, mostly they are there because they did not know and it is because of some sort of an error. So it is not recommended. Too many cases of hyperkalemia, too many cases of renal failure, and bad outcomes. So make sure, and there are most of the people here are somehow or the other involved with patients' medication list, whether you are a medical assistant, a nurse, uh, a physician, physician assistant, nurse practitioner, and make sure that whenever you see this kind of situation, it brings to your, I saw a patient the other day in Boone, he was on ACE inhibitor and ARB for a long time, and this guy gave me an extremely hard time that I've been doing okay with bl this blood pressure medication regimen and I want to continue it because you will see these kind of situation. So we talked about goals with hypertension. At the end of the day, you will turn out to be that you want your blood pressure to be below 130 over 80. I went through those 80 pages. I went through these all slides. They all slides are mumbo jumbo saying the same thing, okay? So maybe recommended, you should do it, this, just forget about it, keep the blood pressure below 130 over 80. The other thing, and I think this is the major slide here, whenever you are starting blood pressure and antihypertensive drug therapy, everybody gets a non-pharmacological therapy, your first line agent should be either a thiazide diuretic, calcium channel blocker, ACE inhibitor, or an ARB. You, you, if you notice, there is no beta blocker here. If you notice, there is no clonidine here. If you notice, um, there are no nitrates here. So it has to be an ACE or ARB, a calcium channel blocker, and a thiazide diuretic. You can make the combination the way you want and according to the patient and some side effects. But this is, for last 10 years, this is what has to be wanted. Do not start patients on beta blockers for hypertension if there is no other indication for beta blocker. And guess what? We still do it. So, and there are a lot of patients on blood pressure medication, and then you say, what is your blood pressure medication? It is etinolol from 20 years ago. So we can make changes in this regard because you will see that if it is not a compelling indication, the blood pressure treated with beta blocker, the outcomes were not that good. So the other issue is combination therapy with monotherapy. And this is my take. If your goal is greater than 20, if you are, say, if you are at 160 and you want to make it to 140, and if you, it's 20 points for systolic, 10 points for diastolic, one medication is not going to do it. So you will end up with two medications. Everybody gets non-pharmacological. And fixed dose combination improves the compliance. It's hard to manage fixed dose com combination when you are titrating up. So my theory is I give them single medications, titrate them up, then I know this is the good, good thing, and then I give them the combination. Otherwise, it becomes confusion. And you will see when we treat heart failure and when we treat hypertension, when we are titrating up the medications, patients are confused because we are changing medications constantly, constantly, checking the labs, bringing up, bringing down, and they end up with too many medications which they don't know what they are doing. Here comes the point. And again, we struggle it every single day in clinic, ask them to bring their medications, check their medications, and then finalize the list. What are you taking? It's on the computer. That's the usual answer. Look it up. That's what I'm taking. And 80% of the time, that's not correct. That's not correct. So uh, this is extremely important. It's very basic elementary medicine. No, nothing fancy. You don't need SARDA to set, tell you anything about it. It's very, 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 very basic. So um, 
follow-up evaluation is extremely important. And if you are in my practice or my kind of practice, where to find a spot becomes an issue. And our uh, one lady, Fran, if you have heard, she is the best you can see in this world who continuously juggles to get the patients in, move the patients here, there. But somehow we all, uh, administrators, doctors, office uh, staff, we all nurses, we all have to figure it out how we are going to follow these patients because that is where the key is. Uh, so adherence and response to treatment at monthly intervals until control is achieved is extremely, extremely important. Otherwise, we'll lose those cases. Where is the timer? Because I can keep speaking, speaking. Um, so we talked about it. Now, now the other thing, other part of it is when to do what. If you have stable ischemic heart disease, use beta blockers, ACE inhibitors. If you have, I'm going to go fast, okay? And these are compelling indications. With prior MI, um, you need a beta blocker. So if you have an arrhythmia, you need a beta blocker. Then the beta blocker is primarily used for the first condition, and then you are using it so for hypertension also. ACE and ARBs are pretty much used in every condition we talked about. So that will be ischemic heart disease, secondary prevention, very good data. Heart failure, extremely good data. We, gave a, uh, we had our grand rounds a few years ago, months ago. Then CKD, very good data. Um, diabetes, very good data. So my favorite go-to medication is ACE inhibitors, ARB. Then if you have angina, calcium channel blockers are great. So these are the way you look into it. So if, and if you have increased uh, uh, volume, or if the cath lab, Dr. Kumar gives you an increased EDP, then diuretics. So the, just think through it. It's very, very simple not to, not to think about too many things. Angina, beta blocker. How would you treat angina? Beta blocker. So then you treat hypertension with beta blocker. So, so these are the recommendations. And those are what the new word is GDMT, Guideline Directed Medical Therapy. And you will hear this GDMT all the time. All these big people who I talk to you about, first class, uh, nice hotels, they made this word GDMT. So now we have to all follow GDMT, Guideline Directed Medical Therapy. Beta blockers are indicated. So if patients have CAD without reduced heart, uh, heart failure, without reduced ejection fraction, uh, and who had an MI more than three years ago and have angina, you should be using beta blockers and calcium channel blockers. Again, what we are treating is we are treating the other condition, the heart disease, the heart failure, and we are using it for blood pressure control. So same thing, if you have angina, you are using this, and if you have no angina, then you can use uh, dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers, thiazide diuretics, or uh, I want to introduce here an, uh, another class of drugs uh, uh, called min mineral corticoid inhibitors. And if your patient, and this is what I do, so I'm giving you my secret. If your patient is not doing well and you have tried all of the medication, use spironolactone. This medication will bring your blood pressure down. Okay? So. Uh, again, spinal lactone in reduced uh, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction is a drug. And we do not use non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers if you have reduced ejection fraction. So you see us changing all the time. We'll get the cardism out or uh, verapamil out of the uh, scheme in that way. Um, if you have a preserved EF, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, beta blockers, very simple. Uh, look into these things. When you are prescribing the medications, you just take 30 seconds, make a list of it, and you just, that's what I do all the time. I'll change one pill, and that will be this this way. I'll look into it, heart failure, oh, if the patient is spironolactone or not, we'll put a spironolactone, and boom, boom, we have the blood pressure control. Patients with CKD are a little tricky because you have to look for album albuminuria. Um, and the buzzword is 300 milligrams per day or 300 milligrams per gram. 
and those are the people who benefit with the ACE inhibitors. And uh, sometimes we get concerned, is Steve here or he left? Uh, so sometimes we, we get concerned uh, about, uh, oh, he's there, uh, about uh, the increased creatinine, and we are not using these ACE inhibitors, but I think as, uh, if we uh, ma measure the creatinine very well in timely manner and try to give ACE inhibitors and ARBs, the outcomes are better. So uh, in CKD, if you see, um, if they are, if they are uh, uh, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, you will see that they will get an ACE inhibitor on ARB. The other thing is, if you are intolerant to ACE inhibitors, then you give ARB because there. I didn't come with the, all those studies because half the people sleep. If I show the studies and graphs, uh, I've been doing it for a long time. So. Uh, so just remember, your first drug is ACE inhibitor. If you are intolerant to ACE inhibitor, then use ARB. Most of us, including me, uh, I'm also guilty of that, that we start ARB because people would have cough and we don't want to deal with it and all okay, let's start ARB. But the guidelines say, if the board question or guidelines say, first start ACE inhibitor and ARB, and you get these letters from the pharmaceutical, comp uh, these insurance companies that the patient is on ARB but not tried ACE, they are correct because the data says that you first start ACE and then ARB. So um, renal transplantation, keep the blood pressure down. And usually we do not see renal transplantation patients. They are usually seen by nephrologists. Um, and you usually treat with them calcium channel blockers. And if you have a patient with renal transplantation and if you are using diltiazem verapamil, remember that they, the levels of your tech uh, mycophenolate and all those things can change because of calcium channel blockers. So you have to measure those levels very well. So anti-rejection medication levels can change with verapamil and uh, diltiazem. So in case if you uh, end up uh, having those patients, just make sure that if you start a calcium channel blocker on those, you check the levels. Otherwise, there will be a problem. And we see that sometimes here. Um, the other big thing is uh, when you have uh, intracranial or intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, and this is where the ICU nurses, and I see some, some of here, uh, if your blood pressure is greater than 220, you start them on IV therapy, either nitroprusside, nicardipine, whatever you want to do, what your pharmacy and your uh, uh, hospital allows. And you have to have closed monitoring. And sometimes we end up doing an art line on these people in ICU. And immediate, this is what the immediate lowering of systolic blood pressure to less than 140 in adults with spontaneous ICH who presents within six hours of an acute event and have a systolic blood pressure between 150 to 200. It's not benefit to reduce the blood pressure below, to, below 150. Remember that. So if your blood pressure is 220, you remo remo decrease it very slowly. And if you decrease it very fast, it is potentially harmful. So that's the reason, even if the blood pressure is 180, 190, and if you give us a call and we say, OK, keep doing it, keep doing it, it's not that we don't care. It's what is recommended. So again, if it is uh, six hours from the sim uh, symptom onset, um, blood pressure 150 to 220, um, and don't reduce it too fast. And if it is greater than 220, then you try to reduce, reduce it slowly. Okay. I have three, four more minutes. So if you're leaving, I'm still on time. Um, so an acute ischemic stroke, uh, again, do not reduce the blood pressure too fast. But if you have to give TPA, you have to follow the TPA guidelines. So uh, you do not give TPA if the blood pressure is 220 or 120. So you have to first decrease the blood pressure and then give TPA. Just remember that. You have to first decrease the blood pressure, then give T T TPA, and then maintain the blood pressure low. And you do not need to drop it below 140. Just remember that. Uh, because if we drop it too much, the problems are more and the, the outcomes don't change much. So as we say, it's Oh, that's my alarm. Uh, so just remember that that uh, 
uh, when you give TPA, and I don't see ER physicians here today, but when you give TPA, blood pressure has to be lower. You first lower the blood pressure, even though if you are losing that time, and then give TPA. Um, secondary stroke prevention, same old same. We talked about it. Ace thiazide diuretic, ACE inhibitor, or ARB, treatment uh, in combination, and all those things. Um, PAD, the same thing, with uh, same medications. So if you look into it, all these things, you will end up being the same thing. ACE inhibitors, ARB, thiazide, diuretic, calcium channel blocker, beta blocker, and then our next line of agents, uh, which usually don't work uh, for long term. So you have seen me that I have been talking about it uh, for last 45 minutes or so. And we have not talked about clonidine. We have not talked about prazosin. We have not about, talked about hydralazine, minoxidil. All these medications can be used for decreasing blood pressure. But these are second, third line agents, not very good data available in terms of reducing mortality or reducing events. But there's a secondary data in terms of that the numbers are lower than the outcomes are better. So that is the reason when you are giving them these medications, you give with the intent that you are decreasing the blood pressure so that the, the outcomes would be better. But we do not have a direct, good, randomized control data on this. Excuse me. Aortic disease, you will see quite often beta blockers. And uh, that's where they are bradycardic, and sometimes there is an issue, but give beta blockers for aortic disease. Uh, other special groups are, um, um, I, I don't like this slide that much, but we have to say that uh, African Americans respond well to thiazides. Rest is all the same. And I talked to you about initially, even before starting the medica medication therapies, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, or direct in inhibitors are, uh, uh, should not be given to preg pregnant women. And how do you treat uh, pregnant women? Again, is uh, uh, you don't have too many medications. Uh, you will not get too many medications because of uh, the way we, our healthcare is set up. Uh, so methyl dopa, nifedipine, labetalol, these are our mainstay of controlling uh, blood pressure. I didn't talk about target organ damage uh, 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 much, but you have to look into your target organ damage, which will be uh, which is in, in the in the guidelines uh, 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 for hypertensive crisis and emergencies when we look into it. Uh, that's a, uh, you have severe preeclampsia, eclampsia, uh, pheochromocytoma crisis. That's the time uh, you reduce your blood pressure uh, to less than 140 in the first hour. And if there's an aortic dissection, you leave. Uh, you reduce it to 120. We don't see aortic dissection here because as soon as we have a diagnosis, we send the patients out. But these are the two situations where you precipitously drop the blood pressure by whatever means you have. You have nipride, nicardipine, um, nitro, whatever you, you want to use it. You use all your armamentarium to decrease the blood pressure because that is where uh, you save a life. Um, and. Uh, uh, without a compelling condition, never reduce your blood pressure uh, greater than 25% of the original, because that's where those uh, intracerebral uh, issues and is uh, ischemic strokes and other things starts happening. And you take two to three days to, uh, to reduce your blood pressure. They say one to two days, but you take your two to three days. You take your sweet time to reduce your blood pressure. Because we s get these calls all the time, oh, blood pressure is high, blood pressure is high. It is OK to reduce it slowly, because it improves outcomes. So we talked a little bit about uh, hypertensive crisis management, um, target organ damage. They go to ICU. You set up an I, um, uh, IV line if needed. You set up an art line, and you treat with your uh, medications, uh, uh, depending upon uh, nitroposide or uh, nicardipine. And sometimes we use in our heart failure patients who are with acute pulmonary edema nitrates, which work very well. Um, in uh, adults, uh, this is a very, very uh, hot topic about how much blood pressure you reduce with people with dementia. If you reduce too fast, too much, they start having falls and other things. But uh, uh, it's reasonable. It's reasonable to bring the blood pressures down, even if they have dementia, cognitive impairment, and all those things. Because ultimately, uh, if you can keep it at 130s or so, you do better. 
uh, if you are going for surgery, uh, if you are on a beta blocker, don't stop it. And if you are not on a beta blocker, don't start it. Plain and simple. If you are on a beta blocker, don't stop it. If you are not on a beta blocker, don't start it. And uh, don't give uh, you know clonidine and all those things so that you have a good number so that you can go through surgery and all those things because they usually will have rebound. So good blood pressure control is important coming in. And if it is, if you are going for an elective surgery, if the blood pressures are not controlled, don't take them in. I know your slot would be lost, but it is lost. Um, uh, and with, if they're going for a major surgery, you will see that we ask them not to do ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and we, that's uh, some studies showing that once you stop them, the renal uh, post-op renal function has uh, some benefits of this. So you can you can uh, stop the uh, ACE inhibitor, ARBs. So we talked about it. Uh, uh, I have so many slides. So let's go to. Um, Oh, one thing my colleagues like it is uh, um, uh, there should be financial incentives uh, for better blood pressure control because uh, it takes a lot of time uh, and we are uh, not financially compensated, but it improves the outcomes and it improves the overall uh, healthcare expenditure. So <coughs> they should look into these things because uh, these really help. And this is a go to slide. Uh, and if you see, apart from these two conditions, uh, when your uh, CVD risk is less than 10%, your uh, BP threshold is this. And secondary stroke prevention, we talked about it, so the b blood pressure less than this. Otherwise, whatever the question is, your target blood pressure is uh, 130 over 80. Thank you very much. I don't have a thank you slide because I want you guys to remember this slide very well. Um, and thank you for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Oh, uh, thank you, Dr. Sarda. That was a great overview of the guidelines. Do you think there's any future for renal denervation? So, when somebody smart asks a question to somebody dumb like me, they just want to prove one point that they are smarter. You are smarter <laughs> than me. There is a future for denervation, re renal denervation. Um, so far, all the trials have not come through, and they are not good. We still have one trial going in, right, Ravi? Uh, Dr. Ghali has one denervation trial going on at Iowa Heart Center. So again, I'm a salaried guy, so it's not financial disclosure. But I think something will come out of these things. Carotid denervation did not work out so far. The renal, But there is something there. There is something happening at the renal level uh, with the, so I think there will be something which will come out. We need to get the right thing. I think there will be. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, thanks. Thanks again for that nice uh, comprehensive review. My question is, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, with an emphasis on uh, out of clinic monitoring of blood pressure, home monitoring, do you have an opinion on the reliability and accuracy of blood pressures cuff center offered in the industry? And is there a mechanism to have a home blood pressure cuff calibrated to make sure that it is accurate? We, we see this situation all the time, and our nurses, uh, a few of them are here sitting here. They will do this following. They will ask the blood patient to bring their monitor at home, so a home monitor at the office. We will check the blood pressure with our cuff, and then we'll check with them, and we'll see if they are around five or so. So the blood pressure monitors are now at thirty, forty, fifty dollars, and that that thirty, forty, fifty dollars, the sensors and all those things. I don't know how much to rely on, but overall they do very well. Overall, so you can look at the patterns, you can look at the things. If the blood pressure readings are pretty good, and then we we do it all the time to bring the ask them to, and then I tell them to have the new batteries or make sure the electrical connection is good. So because if the batteries are low, you will see that they start uh, giving errors or erratic management. What is the, do you have any other suggestions? How do we, because if you go to the industrial level, it's like $1,000 or $800 or those kind of things. And we, then we have our medical department who is calibrating them. But um, buy a new one, buy stock on Omron. Thanks for the talk. I was just wondering, do you have a standard workup that you do for people with asymptomatic hypertension younger than 30? Like, do you just 
I know you showed that slide. Do you always do like renin and aldosterone on those guys? I don't do renin and aldosterone on all those guys. Uh, so, uh, so my uh, thing, my uh, attention, I'm, you know, my attention was on that. But if I got the question right, um, I don't do renin el uh, aldosterone. I do the first slide, which I said CBC, BMP, TSH. Um, usually, I uh, in EKG, and if they, if I don't see anything else, I usually don't do an echocardiogram either. So, uh, if the blood pressure is not well controlled after my initial therapy, then I go after those things. Yes. Yeah. Uh, what's the link between alcohol and hypertension? Is it a an immediate effect? I mean, like if you have a drink, your blood pressure goes up, or is it a cumulative effect? Uh, so high, alcohol causes vasodilatation, so your, uh, your blood pressure can go down also after alcohol. Uh, uh, but the studies have shown that people who had two or more alcohol drinks, it's difficult to control blood pressure uh, compared to people who are not drinking alcohol. So that's where the linking, but alcohol causes vasodilatation, so it's not the immediate right. increase in blood pressure. I don't know how while you get after drinking alcohol that your blood pressure will go up, but usually it does not, as far as I can Is that I if you control for weight and all that, and, and cigarette smoking and other issues that, that people, alcoholics have, is it still a, a hypertensive agent? I have to make something up now. <laughs> uh, so um, this, is, this is an extremely good scientific observation and scientific question, uh, that what is causing what. And uh, the, the decisions we make and the things which we show up also have a lot of gray area in those things. And as, as, as the low socioeconomic status goes with pretty much every disease, because of these factors which we just talked about. But alcohol in those uh, studies which were done around 30 years ago, so remember these alcohol studies are 30 years ago, 20, 30 years ago. And we don't have too much new data on alcohol except for any drink is worse. Now with the cannabis, the, the new alcohol data is coming because of the cannabis. Tra uh, cannabis. Uh, so uh, there were some studies uh, where they looked for all these things and alcohol still caused higher uh, chances of having less, and, and it may be adherence issues, I don't know. I don't know. But it's a very good scientific observation. Very good. So for the speaker's sake, make some questions up. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you very much, guys.